Good morning, and we'll call to order the meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada, Ms. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Your number one item is to conduct your first citizens' participation period. It's the first time set aside for public comment. Those wishing to speak to the commission on a posted agenda item, now is your opportunity. Seeing and hearing no one, we'll close this portion of public comment. Thank you. Second item is to approve your agenda. Your agenda is in order and ready for your approval. Motion, Motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number three is to receive your general manager's report. We do have some things to share with you. First, we'd like to recognize a mechanic from Keolis. This month's Mechanic Recognition Award goes to Lloyd McKenzie. Lloyd, are you with us? Come on down. Lloyd is a modest individual who does not seek recognition, yet promotes the core values of Keolis. Through his dedication and uh, diligence to solve problems, he was promoted to a specialized team that works on diesel electric streetcars. Lloyd has worked to understand the complex technology and master the maintenance of these vehicles. He often works 10 to 12 hour shifts and comes in on scheduled days off. He also canceled a scheduled vacation to attend a specialized air conditioning training. Lloyd has assisted in the development of many procedures now used in the maintenance of streetcars and has trained several of the technicians working on these vehicles. His ability to find alternative solutions to intricate problems and mentor other mechanics sets him apart. Again, join me in congratulating and recognizing Lloyd McKenzie. I just want to say thanks to Keolis and recognizing the hard work that I do. Thank you. board members would stay up. We'd also like to recognize an outstanding driver from our paratransit service contractor, Transdev. Do we have Aubrey Hikes with us? Aubrey. Hey. Aubrey has always shown outstanding customer service, exemplary attendance, and compassion for all of his passengers. He works with individuals from Opportunity Village and Easter Seals on a daily basis. His passengers know him as the singing bus driver. Yeah, because he... <laughs> Aubrey makes it... Aubrey makes it a point to remember his passengers' names so he can use them in his songs. And this seemingly small gesture results in big smiles. While working in the field, the RTC Quality Assurance Team has witnessed Aubrey's customer service skills when working with passengers and agency staff members. He displays dedication, initiative, and leadership, and carries through on delivering safe, friendly, and reliable service. So again, help me recognize and appreciate Aubrey. Thank you. I would just like to say thank you to everyone that is involved with me receiving this award. I also like to say hello to my beautiful family at home watching. This is my wife's birthday, so happy yeah. birthday, sweetheart. <laughs> Just, oh, singers, singers. Yeah. You put me on the spot about that. Uh, happy birthday, sweetheart. Happy Aww. birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to uh, give a special thanks to Sandy Neely. Uh, Jennifer Allen and uh, Nicole Robertson for recommending that I uh, receive this award. And um, to the TransDev team, for all the managers, all the dispatchers, and the fellow drivers, you all make my job a lot easier, and I just appreciate you all. Thank you. members if you could stay standing for one more recognition. Next we'd like to recognize the RTC Superstar of the Quarter. This outstanding employee works on our trans, transit amenities team. 
As a technician, he stepped up to the plate after his department lost three experienced staff members to retirements and promotion. To cover the tasks normally covered by four employees, he streamlined processes and made more than 300 shelter and station repairs by himself. He was able to cut procurement costs by salvaging spare parts from damaged shelters, resulting in cost savings of several of, of thousands of dollars. This technician has gone above and beyond to assist his supervisor in training the department's two new employees. Please join me in recognizing this, super, this quarter superstar, Joe Seneknek. Joe, Uh, I just want to say thank you to Tina and uh, MJ and Carl um, and the rest of my team and anybody else that had anything to do with all of this. <laughs> so, thank you guys very much. This means a lot. to you on a quarterly basis to report the status of fuel revenue indexing and we're happy to report that as of the end of last year we had 223 design and construction contracts that had been awarded um, which included 78 small local businesses getting work for a total of 452 million that has been awarded to date uh, creating approximately economists tell us that he equates to about 5,800 jobs and I'm really, you recall that when we first started this program, we thought we would have 199 projects that would be awarded, um, that would be awarded contracts. And that number is now up to 223 um, because we, did, we were lucky enough to, for uh, bids to come in uh, under budget, under, under, under en engineer's estimates. So we got a few more jobs out of it. Um, so of those 225 total projects, so, uh, so of the total, we, we know we're going to be able to award 225, so we've got a couple more to award. Um, and at that point, let's see, 86, so 137 have been completed, 86 in progress. We only have two left, only two more projects under FRI 1 that still need to be awarded. So hopefully when we come back to you next quarter, we'll be able to say, check the box. Everything under that first fuel revenue indexing effort will have been awarded. So that's a big deal. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Deputy General Manager MJ Maynard to provide you with an update on the state of the transit system. Thanks, Tina. Good morning, Chairman Brown and members of the commission. Uh, today is a mid-year update that looks at data from the first six months of our current fiscal year, so uh, July through December 2017, compared to the same period uh, last year. During our last fixed route focus group, drivers made a number of operational suggestions regarding specific bus stops throughout the Las Vegas Valley. As a result, the RTC was able to make improvements, including uh, working with a property owner to remove landscaping at a stop that was obstructing the driver's view of the passengers, and also creating a new, more durable system for posting temporary sign closure information. Also, during our September paired transit driver focus group, most of the driver's concerns pertain to issues that were addressed by their contract or transdev, However, we answered questions surrounding the new mobile, mobile data terminal system that's going to be installed later this year. Uh, we'll, we'll ensure that the drivers and dispatch get training. Many thanks, though, to the operators. Their feedback really makes us a better agency. So let's take a look at our fixed route transit system. For our fixed route ridership, we experienced a 2% decrease overall. This is mainly attributed to a 9% decrease of ridership on the strip where we continue to see customers choose transportation network, network companies or TNCs such as Uber and Lyft for their mode of transportation. General market ridership continues to, to remain relatively steady. So to put that into perspective, the national bus ridership was down almost 5%, 4.89% in 
in the third quarter of 2017 versus the same quarter in 2016. So we're sort of bucking the trend here in Las Vegas from the general market perspective um, because it, our ridership uh, at this point has only decreased by less than a percent. The decrease in ridership is also reflected in our fixed route revenue, where we experience decreases across the board. As you can see, the biggest drop is 12% in the resort corridor, where revenues decreased by approximately $1.3 million. So here is a year-over-year -year comparison of our strip revenue. So please note that each bar is from November to November of each year. Uber and Lyft began operating in Nevada in October of 2015, and November of 2015 is when we began to see the impacts of another transportation option in the resort corridor. As noted on the slide, we've yet to hit a plateau where revenues are stabilized at a quote-unquote new normal level. From November of 2014 through December 2017, we've cumulatively lost $7.6 million in revenue. We'll be working with an outreach company as part of an overall strip customer survey project. Uh, the goal here is to learn, we're hoping that we can learn more about the transportation choices that the customers are making. Um, you know, why choose one mode over another in order to kind of analyze the trends that we're seeing in uh, revenue and ridership. Next slide, okay. We always chat on-time performance, obviously a very big deal to our customers. So uh, the on-time performance improves slightly for our five-minute on-time standard, which now stands at 89%. The total number, the number of total road calls decreased slightly by 1.7%, and heat-related shutdowns saw a 4% decrease. Based on our aggressive fleet replacement program, we saw less buses breaking down this past summer. Uh, that meant better performance, which really equals better customer service and a better customer experience. So while maintenance remains consistent, there is still room for improvement. The RTC plans to create a new predictive maintenance program that will address all heat-related performance issues. This program will include post-preventative maintenance inspections and quality assurance checks that will improve the overall condition of the fleet and we'll be able to meet the demands of both our locals and our tourists. And here are some highlights from our transit amenities department. Today there are a total of 3,380 bus stops. To date we have pushed back over 1,200 shelters where we have the right of way by five feet or more from the curb. In 2018, we will continue working with private property owners to acquire the necessary land to push back more shelters. Additionally, we improved the technology at 150 bus stops to increase lighting and extend the life of the solar batteries. Uh, we continue to hear that's a concern for our customers, uh, ensuring that they feel safe at the stops. We repainted shelters along the Sahara Express and Boulder Highway Express routes. We refinished 376 benches to reduce surface temperature, not so hot when they sit down and provide a more vandal-proof finish. And we also launched a new bus stop database and immediately performed an audit on every single bus stop to ensure the accuracy of all the database information. Actually, everybody in green up there, that's what they did. <laughs> that's right. Um, and advertising revenue from both bus shelters and buses, which pays for the maintenance of the bus stops, increased by more than 12% to almost $1.9 million. So at this point, the advertising revenue, it's, it's almost a net zero in terms of what it costs to maintain it and clean them. Uh, we continue to see an, an increase in the amount of advertising contracts secured by our contractor, Vector Media. They're doing a really good job. Moving on to our paratransit system, we saw an 11.2% increase in newly certified paratransit riders from the same six-month time frame in 2017 versus 2016. In comparison, the number of total paratransit trips increased by nearly 5% to almost 605,000 trips for the first six months of the fiscal year. On-time performance decreased slightly from 95% to 93.8%, though which is still a, a very good percentage, uh, despite seeing more demand in the number of total paratransit trips. Currently, Transdev is in the process of hiring more drivers to accommodate the increased demand. With regard to our senior transportation trips on our Silver Star routes and FDR services, we saw a 1.5% increase in the amount of trips taken for the first six months of this fiscal year. The number of trips taken on our Veterans Medical Transportation Network saw a large 21.4% increase due to more clients signing up for the service. And finally, the number of mobility trained customers remained steady 
with 428 new clients who are trained to travel more independently by using our fixed route system. And Ride RTC, our mobile ticketing and trip planning app, has been downloaded more than 115,000 times. Customers have purchased more than 300,000 bus passes since we launched Ride RTC in September of 2016. And the last, uh, is very brief, the last item of the State of the System report is to receive an update from RTC safety, safety and Security Manager Scott Gallegos. Thank you, MJ. Good morning, Chairman and Board members. Again, for the record, I'm Scott Gallegos. I am the Manager of Safety and Security Operations. In March 2017, the RTC entered into a renewed agreement with Allied Universal and was able to maintain the same budget of $8.4 million. We are pleased to report that operator assaults by passengers were down by 62.5% during that same six month period from 2016. We attribute much of the success to the installation of driver barrier doors and the effective safety campaigns that were instituted by our contractors, MV and Keolis. Unfortunately, passenger on passenger assaults have increased by more than 40% on our fixed route system. There are 66 passenger on passenger assaults for the first six months of the fiscal year compared to 47 last year. In order to more fully understand this upward trend, we're working with our security contractor to implement a technology solution and that will assist and be more effective in deploying our officers in real time to those routes where the incidents are occurring. As I just mentioned, we have, become, uh, we have begun using SideComp technology an internal application that provides improved officer GPS at all the transit locations to increase our officer accountability and improve deployments and overall safety. SICOP can also provide us with real-time information during incidents and help us allocate security resources in a more efficient manner. Thank you. Mayor Goodman. Yes, do you have the breakdown on the assaults, um, the age? Um, and whether they're locals or whether they're visitors um, on that increase that went from 47 to 66 in the assault category, passenger on passenger. That is something that we are looking at now. After looking at these numbers, we are going to drill down and break down by time frames, locations, uh, age groups, what, what we need to do to see how we can effectively uh, utilize our security uh, um, resources to strategically uh, mount a campaign to get this number down. Um, if I may continue, Mr. Chairman, um, on that, does the driver, when that assault takes place, does the driver then go up and interfere or take down the information? How is that recorded? Well, well they call in, they stay behind the barrier because we found that with passengers, if that driver is exposed, they'll go after the driver. So. We want them to be the eyes and ears and call into their communication center reporting what's going on so we can get the resources to them as soon as possible. And then again, too, um, what, what is meant by assault? If I just do that, am I assaulting or are you, you getting up out of, you know, I mean, I think those are points that really will help uh, control what's going on on the bus. Absolutely. And, and Mayor, just to clarify, an assault, the other way that they're compiled here, um, somebody can spit on somebody, that's an assault. Um, oh. it, it, but certainly t touching somebody could be considered assault, but we work closely with Metro. If it's um, severe enough, dispatch will call Metro and they'll immediate, that's, a, that's like a 911 and they respond very quickly. And are, are those recorded by cameras? On Correct, audio, on audio camera. yep, audio as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That concludes your general manager's report. Your next item on your agenda is to receive the Nevada Department of Transportation Director's Report, Mr. Rudy Malkavon. Thank you, Tina. I wanted to uh, express my appreciation for Tracy Larkin Thompson, my deputy director, for covering for me last month. Mm -hmm. I was at the National Governors Association Conference here in Southern Nevada, and it was a great event. But thanks to Tracy for covering. Uh, so. On the federal funding side, we're under this temporary extension of funding called the Continuing Resolution, or CR. It expires tonight at midnight, so um, what we're hearing is that the House has the votes to pass 
an extension to March 23rd. And the Senate has a general agreement on a two-year spending bill, which adds an additional $20 billion for infrastructure. Now, you've heard about the Trump uh, administration's desire to have an infrastructure package passed by Congress. The President talked about that at the State of the Union, a $1.5 trillion uh, infrastructure program. Details are supposed to come out next Monday from the administration. Um, he didn't say where the money's coming from, so that's what we're really on the edge of our seat about, is, is it real money? The, um, the continuing resolution process, though, has not delayed any of our, our federal aid projects. Um, it's, uh, but we hope that they reach a settlement and have a long-term spending bill for the rest of appropriations um, through the rest of this year, and, and possibly if they take the Senate version through the next fiscal year as well. Uh, Tracy and I will be visiting our delegation at the end of this month, and recently we met with uh, all of our Nevada uh, Metropolitan Planning Organizations, the MPOs, here in our state, so that re we really want to understand uh, the points of, of consensus and agreement on transit policy, transportation policy, and funding, so that we, when we visit our delegation, we speak with one voice, and we each go at our, our different times. I know Tracy is able to, um, because of her ability to be on some uh, research panels. She's back in D.C. a lot more often than I'm able to get there, thankfully. But uh, we want to speak with the same talking points. So it's really good for that type of consensus and collaboration and discussion with RTC of Southern Nevada, Washoe, Carson area, and Tahoe. Those are the four MPO areas. Um, last week we kicked off another great project. Uh, I'm thankful for uh, Chairman Brown for your representation at, at that groundbreaking event. Um, for a uh, significant project for US 95 widening from Durango to Kyle Canyon. A lot of uh, local funds, 33 million of local funds between City of Las Vegas, RTC, Clark uh, County Regional Flood Control District. Uh, there's a, it's as, this is a, a major improvement for widening and it completes the widening up, up for the, up to Kyle Canyon Road. Um, the city's basically funding the construction of, of an interchange there sooner than we would have been able to get to it. And the flood control district is out there uh, putting money towards protection of, of life and property. So it's a really good collaborative effort. Um, thank you for uh, the board for approving the addition of the NDOT project, specifically the phase 3C of Centennial Bowl at the 215 Beltway and US 95 interchange. We want to advertise that project as soon as possible, and we've accelerated that into the current fiscal year through the action of the board and then adoption into the statewide plan. We've recently held a public information meeting on uh, the Tropicana Interchange and, and the Hacienda Harmon HOV ramps. Um, that's an environmental assessment, or EA, which takes typically a couple of years for federal approvals. So unfortunately, we're unable to get all that infrastructure built for those um, Tropicana, Hacienda Harmon HOV. Um, by the time the NFL stadium is scheduled to open at uh, the 2020 season. Um, but we're advancing these projects and accelerating them as, as soon as we can. We're gonna have to see through uh, the preliminary engineering efforts at, at uh, Harmon and Hacienda what we can build more immediately. The Tropicana Interchange has some challenges with right-of-way acquisition and, and design, but basically Tropicana Interchange will be reconstructed entirely um, in order to get some more lanes underneath on I-15. As, as you know, some of those bridge columns restrict us from widening the freeway in that area. Um, I have with me today uh, our project manager from Project Neon, Dale Keller. Uh, he's gonna give a short presentation. Uh, we had a public information meeting last month on uh, Project Neon. A lot of work to, to occur. You, you've seen the, the, the lane, the off-ramp closure right there at, um, at eastbound Charleston. Uh, so you see a lot more traffic coming onto Grand Central Parkway. But Dale's going to cover what, what to anticipate this year on Project Neon as we're kind of getting into the home stretch of the, the last year and a half of this construction project. Dale? Thank you, Rudy. Uh, for the record, Dale Keller, INDOT Project Manager for Project Neon. Uh, provided you a quick update of Project Neon. Uh, believe it or not, we are over the halfway mark of the largest transportation project in the state. Our contractor, our design builders, earn roughly about $350 million of the $600 million contract. And big picture wise, uh, we are on schedule. The design is finished up. If you look at the schedule bar at the bottom of the screen, it hasn't changed since we started. Uh, in 2017, we focused on the local street network as well as US 95 with Carnado as well as the Dick Squeeze. 
and in this March, uh, next month here, we'll be focused on the most critical work on the I-15 as we uh, named it the main event. Uh, so it'll be a 10 month period, work around the clock, six days a week, it'll be fun and exciting as we get this most critical work done. And then we'll finish and wrap this project up in summer of 2019. So a few takeaways, what the main event will look like. We'll have downtown I-15 impacts. We'll reduce main line of I-15, both northbound and southbound by one lane in each direction. In addition, we'll have spaghetti bowl ramp closures on the one thing to bring your attention would be the US 95 southbound to I-15 southbound ramp is one of the he heaviest move movement ramps in the state that we reduced down to two lanes down to one lane. It'll be a similar detour that we had with the Carnado closure. And lastly, when we reconstruct literally the crossroads of US 95 and I-15, we'll have six marathon weekend closures of US 95, and we're working closely with the city to talk about effective detours for that. So fun and exciting. Uh, so I'm a big believer that pictures are a lot better than words. So here's what the first kind of round one will look into as a main event when we start here in March through the summer here. So once again, all the lanes are going to be reduced down uh, to three lanes in each direction and north of the speed bull actually down to two lanes each direction. So we do this in two halves. So we'll reconstruct all the southbound lanes first and push everybody over in the southbound. <laughs> I, I believe I have it. I know I'm, uh, Mike Jansen has it as well. So, uh, One thing to note, the Charleston off-ramp uh, will be open at this time as well. I know it's cr uh, closed currently, but back in March, uh, March of 6th, we'll be back open southbound. It will be an exit from the left side temporarily. One thing to help alleviate traffic and add more mobility uh, through downtown during this construction, we're adding a new way to get onto I-15. This would be at Pinto Lane and MLK. Pinto is just a little bit south of Alta Bonneville to provide more access back to I-15 when we have the Charleston on-ramp closed. So as we go from Charleston south to Sahara, uh, we'll be in three lanes of this configuration as we complete through the detour. Once again, this is about a 10 month time frame. So it's gonna be for after NASCAR weekend on March 6th through November and we'll get done right before Thanksgiving. In addition to the main event, uh, we will be ping ponging down the I-15 with the construction of the ATM um, sign construction. ATM stands for Active Traffic Management. Um, this is gonna happen along the resort corridor. Our first focus will be between Sahara and Flamingo between now and, and August and then we'll focus down from Flamingo down to Russell and have this complete a spring of 2019. Some of these benefits of these ATM signs, uh, working closely with FAST to provide motorists real-time traffic information, provides lane management as you see presented out of this diagram to the left, dynamic ramp metering and speed harmonization. I know a few of you may have been stuck on the US 95 this morning of an of a accident and these signs will help reduce second accidents to help clear the congestion faster as you're spaced every half mile to help motorists um, get through either accidents or constructions. So what is this pain? What's the gain we're gonna get for this pain? A uh, few things to take away. All the I-15 lanes will be in the final configuration when this is done at the end of the year. In addition, all southbound I-15 ramp oper traffic operations will be improved with ramp braiding, as well as uh, Councilman Tarkanian's Ward Ward 1, all the new sound walls will be constructed for her residents. And lastly, I'll just like to leave you. Here's a few ways you can communicate with the project. And um, we've been trying to do our best to get the information out there before we get calls from the mayor. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. Comments or questions? Commissioner. Thank you. Um, do your engineers actually go out on site or they just draw internally? In regards to the construction and the design of this project? The, yes, they do to go on site, and one of the things, we have a co-located office where the contractor and engineers are all together. At the peak of our design, we had roughly 150 engineers working directly with the contractor to get the best solution. Glad to hear it, because I think that's something we need to make sure, because with no disrespect, I've heard from engineers as well as other folks that sometimes they only do the GIS and they don't ever travel the road that they're driving on, they never driven it, and don't really understand the nuances that sometimes have to come into design. So I would hope that we would make sure that our folks actually go out and walk it, taste it, trip over it, 
get dri <laughs> driven into that part of it. And then um, the Kyle, Cam uh, that, that's all I had for you. Yeah. I have a question for Rudy and Mr. Chair when, when you're ready. <clears throat> I just wanted to say, and I've said this before, but while he's here, I want to say it again. I have been so very impressed with what NDOT has done to help us. Uh, my ward is greatly affected because it parallels the freeway. And every time we had a problem uh, and a resident would come to us and we went to NDOT, uh, it, they took care of the problem as quickly as possible. I haven't had one resident come to me and say it wasn't done right or that NDOT didn't help them. All of them have been full of high praise. This is very different from when I first came on the council because at that time we had some projects that weren't cleaned up for two or three years that left lights not. And the personal way that you worked with individuals, even though you might have gotten a little tired of maybe some crabbiness, <laughs> but in any case, it just was magnificent. And I want to thank you for all of the residents of our ward. Thank you. Merely. I guess since we're going to be bragging, I'd like to brag too. Uh, you show me any organization that wins, and I'll show you a good leader. And uh, Tracy and Rudy are doing a great job. I get uh, tons of it. I just was recognized this the other day in the newspaper and the email blasts that are going out to our residents. Um, Craig Road lane closure for so many hours. We get that quickly. Bridge inspection lane reductions. We get that quickly. I-95, 30. And 93, I-15, probably in 93, notification of cones in the area. And our last was our Eastern Civic Center information that you just put out. So I called Tony just to tell him thank you so much. But I would like to publicly thank you and Tracy for the great leadership. And this gentleman here, you guys are doing fantastic at making us partners. It is a new day at, DM, at uh, NDOT. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to come down and talk about NDOT? <laughs> Put him up on that pedestal. That's good. Uh, Key with, uh, and, and your team, Rudy, has just done a phenomenal job, especially on the communication side. It's greatly appreciated. Commissioner. Thank you, Rudy. Two things. On the Kyle Canyon, okay, so it's the interchange, the city's paying for that, but I believe it was tied to a project that I opposed years ago with, to go at the base of that at the hill. So is that part of why that interchange is having to be done? I'll have to confirm the split of funding. I, th I think that there's between the flood control district and the, the city's funding, um, which I assume was FRI funding, was a, a, about mid 30 million on a $80 million project. So are you widening the road as you go up the hill? Yes, as well? we're, we're, we had the uh, environmental clearance to widen all the way to Kyle Canyon, but Kyle Canyon itself is not being widened be a separate project if we we're going to. So then we're going to have a plan for more people when and if we ever get snow again um, for coming up and down that hill in a more safe manner because if you just add lanes, you're going to have more problems coming up the hill. I think that it's so environmentally sensitive. I, we haven't done the environmental study of Kyle Canyon and what's needed there, and I'm sure that there'd be a lot of folks against widening. I might be looking at one right now. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking at one. <laughs> and then so secondary. We, we don't have plans on widening Kyle Canyon Road at this time. And then secondarily, um, can you just get a list at some point of when you accelerated the Tropicana component to deal with the stadium, what projects got lowered so that we can really see what shifted? So the, uh, we didn't delay or defer any projects to add in the Tropicana uh, project because what we looked at was the cost of the, doing the environmental portion of, of the study is pretty minimal. It's really the construction phase. and. Uh, what I presented to the board in December, our transportation board, was that let's look at uh, all the projects, not only the Tropicana, Hacienda Harmon projects, but other major interchanges with the system to system beltway interchanges primarily with US um, uh, 95, with, with uh, the, the last phase of that US 95 interchange, I-15 North and the beltway and uh, the Henderson Spaghetti Bowl, um, to look at all those projects together is going to cost so much for construction. And that's really where the lion's share of the money is, and we're looking at our bonding capacity. Um, the, so it's, it's not to, to affected any projects. It's really when we get to discussion of construction and which year of construction can start that we look at. And, and the board approved our um, issuance of, of 
some bonds, or at least building a biennial budget that's assuming some, some bond sales for the next biennium that would support okay. those other projects. And the paper mentioned something mentioned. like 899 million again. Is that what you have any bonds for? So the, um, I know that the, the reports were about the 899 million. If you go back to the special session of the legislature, there was a report that NDOT did at the, the governor's direction at the transportation board meeting um, that he wanted to understand what are the improvements that are in that area. NDOT compiled a report that looked at projects that were already in the pipeline, whether it was uh, from the, the list of projects that we get into the RTCs program for the long term, long range, or whether it was a kind of a would like to do list that we were looking at for possible uh, fuel revenue indexing projects and funding. So the, uh, our consultant looked at between the, the STIP, which is the four-year program, the long-range program, which is the Regional Transportation Program, the RTP, and the, the NDOT list of FRI possible projects. Mm -hmm. They looked at the projects that were in the vicinity of, of Tropicana and the stadium, and that's where that list came up with $899 million of improvements. Obviously, we're not going to do $899 million in the near term there because there's a lot of needs, as I mentioned, those interchanges that with the Beltway are all over town, and we're looking at, at uh, really re reducing bottlenecks all over town on our freeway system, not just the, the projects that are near Tropicana and the stadium. And then the Henderson Spaghetti Bowl, where is that at? So the, um, we need to do some more coordination because we, uh, I know that the, the city of Henderson, we agree with the city of Henderson that it's, it is a, a major bottleneck that has to be addressed, but we haven't issued an RFP yet for the uh, environmental okay, study so that would clear look that. At Lake Mead um, going west and then coming um, north then to merge onto 95 because you only have one lane turning onto that and two yes. go to Boulder City and that's where exactly. you get Exactly, so we want to fix all those up. issues. Gotcha. But we want to um, do I'm it collaboratively with the city. Uh, we feel that was one of the projects, that, as I mentioned, that we identified to the board that we need to get going on. Uh, it's not as advanced as some of the other projects I mentioned because we, we still have to do the environmental clearance and then eventually get into the design and, and construction phases. And then finally, several years ago, I think it was former Assemblyman, um, passed legislation to do my, for NDOT to be working on minority hiring and some things along those lines. How is that program going? So I, um, we had had a program that would look at, uh, we, and we would put it in our specifications, that would look at hiring opportunities. Right now we're working directly with the RTC on, we really love the program that, that the RTC has implemented mm -hmm. with the fuel revenue indexing projects because it's a lot simpler approach and direct outreach. Um, rather than, than relying on one major contract and one contractor, it makes sense for us to do it more as a program and look at all of our projects. So we'll be, we're gonna continue working with the RTC and the, the local chambers of commerce that represent a, a lot of those, like the Urban Chamber, the Asian Chamber of Commerce, and uh, a lot of the unions that uh, represent a lot of those um, trade unions that, that have workers that are minorities and women that wanna get in the construction workforce. So we're gonna keep working on that, but make, make it a more of a program-wide approach. And then that way you do stuff then up in North and the rurals as well, so that it's by programmatic area, correct? Yes, we do. Um, <coughs> Thank you. The same thing with the northern. It's it's just a lot less opportunity in the north than, than down here. Rudy, Mayor March. Rudy, I wondered what the status of the Boulder Highway is as well. So uh, we're jointly doing the study, uh, funding the study on Boulder Highway, um, all the way from Henderson up to Fremont Street uh, in downtown Las Vegas to see wh what would be the, the future um, of Boulder Highway. As we have seen, that was the old highway into town. It doesn't need as many lanes possibly in the future, uh, even with growth anticipated in the area. So we're, we're um, waiting for the results of that study. What I've um, said is that we wanna see what the study recommends as far as uh, future projects and then get it into the, the plan. The plan um, that the RTC puts together is, it's very fluid and, and um, constantly being updated based on where uh, development is occurring and what some of the needs are in the valley, whether it's safety, economic development, or, or mobility. I think the RTC does a good job of pulling together all the entities down here, including NDOT as well, to see what's the, the, the best approach to take in, in phasing projects. And so I think that more is to come once the, the study is done on Boulder Highway, 
that we would see what are the, the kind of the low hanging fruit first and, and fund some of the preliminary engineering for design in the plan and then eventually construction. Thank you, and I really appreciate that being an important priority for the for NDOT. I know a, a number of years ago there was some discussion here that the governor had actually uh, accelerated a road in northern Nevada where there were a lot of deaths and he had lost a friend on, on that particular road. Well, we know that the Boulder Highway is a very serious roadway where we see a lot of, of uh, pedestrians crossing yes, and, and, and dying. So I think that this is an important road that, that NDOT board really does need to look at seriously. That's a, a good point, Mayor. and. Uh, Commissioner June Kiliani has also made that point that we are proceeding with our safety improvements as we have Boulder Highways now and there is a, a more safety improvements to come at, at some of these pedestrian crossings and lighting improvements. Um, having those median um, zones that where they can have a, if they stop mid, mid crossing that they have a, a safe haven there in the, in the center of the road in the case that they didn't cross during the, the timing signal or traffic is not allowing them, not stopping them, not allowing them to cross, that they have um, an area where they can stop and stand and wait for the traffic to stop for them. Commissioner. I, think I believe also the groups, they were doing surveys and they came to some conclusion, I'm told, I was told the other day that they'd prefer center running if they did either bus, urban, <coughs> urban light rail, light rail, something along those lines. So that was part of what was being discussed too. Um, I'm sure that they're looking into the, all modes of transportation in the study. So pedestrian, transit, uh, bicycles. Bicycles and everything else should all okay. be addressed. Thank you. I'll take light rail on Boulder Highway and Maryland Parkway. <laughs> Thank you, Rudy. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, if I, um, I have to run to the legislation. Uh, the legislature has the interim finance committee and I, we have a major work program for some of these projects that I've mentioned, just ad adjustments to our, our budget. So thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, we are now ready for your consent agenda. Your consent agenda is made up of items five through 42 and may be taken in one motion. A motion on the floor, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion carries. That brings us to item number 43 and Deputy General Manager MJ Maynard will introduce that item. Thanks, Tina. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> excuse me, item 43 is to approve a six month RTC ride on demand pilot program with Lyft to provide services for certified paratransit uh, customers. I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan Helen, who's our Director of Paratransit and Specialized Services for the RTC, and he's going to give an overview of the pilot program. Good morning, Chairman Brown. I'm and commissioners, I'm Dan Howland, Director of Paratransit and Specialized Services. And I'm here today to share with you a pilot program that we are presenting for board approval. With your permission, we would like to launch this program next week to a small group of customers. As you know, the RTC is always looking for ways to improve our service to our customers to help them move around the valley more efficiently. One avenue is examining how to incorporate emerging technologies into our system and our operations. As we've done in the past, we've reached out to mentor cities in an effort to learn what others are doing to incorporate technology into their operations. Staff conducted a peer review of transit agencies around the country to learn about national trends and best practices. We wanted to find better ways to effectively transport customers and enhance their experience while saving money to reinvest back into our system. We found that the MBTA in Boston, WMATA in Washington, D.C., and OCTA in Orange County were working with taxi and transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft to supplement transportation for paratransit customers. Based on what we heard from those transit agencies, we wanted to try a similar pilot program here in Southern Nevada. For the past year, we've been working on a framework and having discussions with our transportation providers. And I'm excited to say and announce that we have an agreement with Lyft to engage in a six-month pilot program. We are starting with a small group to accurately validate the results of the pilot. If it's successful, then we will look to expand the program to other groups like veterans, dialysis patients, and the visually impaired. Select customers have been invited to opt into the program and those who opt in can hail a ride on Lyft via the Lyft app. Individuals without access to a smartphone 
or that require a wheelchair accessible vehicle may call our customer care department. They won't have to schedule rides in advance unless they want to, and they can get a ride on demand and get picked up within minutes if they want to. Now customers will continue to pay $3 one way, and the RTC will subsidize the ride up to $15 each way. And if the ride costs more than $18 total, the client has the option to pay the remaining balance or to cancel the ride and use their existing service. In determining the subsidy cost, our analysis found that the average paratransit ride length is 10 miles each way. Now, Lyft was designed with accessibility in mind to provide a ride to anyone. Some features were built to assist with accessibility needs like text-to-speech interfacing for the visually impaired. <coughs> Lyft has improved transportation access for a wide range of people with different needs, including those with low vision, those who have a hearing impairment, and those who use a foldable wheelchair or walker. As drivers are onboarded to Lyft, driver education on accessibility begins with Lyft's non-discrimination policy. Discrimination against passengers can result in deactivation from the Lyft platform. In addition, Lyft provides education materials to all drivers with a focus on accessibility and how drivers can assist passengers who are wheelchair users, visually impaired, hard of hearing, or deaf. Lyft also provides ongoing driver education materials through webinars, online videos, driver ratings, and through in-person support at Lyft's Las Vegas Drivers Hub. Finally, Lyft has committed to work with RTC staff to develop an educational blog post for Las Vegas area Lyft drivers about the program, as well as brief new drivers at onboarding events about the partnership as part of its non-discrimination education. With regards to our outreach, our goal was to personally touch each client who has the opportunity to opt into this program. And the RTC held three in-person outreach events. Additionally, multiple mailings and phone calls were made to each client, explaining the pilot and that participation is optional. To gauge the success of this program, RTC staff will continue outreach to the pilot program group through emails, mailings, phone calls, surveys, and face-to-face -face contact. So next steps, with your approval, the pilot would launch on Monday, February 12th. At the end of this pilot program, RTC staff will evaluate the results of the pilot and come back to provide their recommendations and seek further direction from you. And if I could just say, I'd like to thank Tina and MJ for their vision in getting us to this point. And I'd also like to thank our project manager, Antoinette Braddock, who has really done a great w job getting us to this point as well. And with that, that concludes my remarks, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dan. Comments or questions? Commissioner? I think this is a good start. I know that um, looking at both our elderly as well as our disabled population, but I think we still at some point still have to have our conversation with regard to transit and the extension and, and those kinds of requests. So, um, but I think this will be kind of interesting. As long as, so you're saying they can accommodate even if they have a wheelchair, if you have to call in or you're, you're um, hard of hearing, so there's Lyft, apparently, you said, has this type of app available. They have uh, an app that you can use on the road. We have um, Lyft folks that can come up and speak to exactly what they can provide these individuals who need those type of considerations. So if you'd like to and I'm just curious, they, when they call, I'm going to assume they say, I need this accommodation made. Is that how the... Well, we, they have the ability to call into our call center. Okay. And they can, they can request a WAVE vehicle to come get them. Lyft doesn't have WAVE vehicles, so that would be done internally. Gotcha. Paul, do you have anything to add to... Yeah, I can talk briefly to that. So um, we have a concierge platform You'll need that to we say launched. who you are. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Jumped right in. Um, I'm Paul Davis, and I'm a transportation um, project manager at Lyft. Um, I work on our, all of our transit partnerships around the U.S. Um, previously, I was a public transit and land use planner down in San Diego where I worked on jobs access, reverse commute programs, um, and the implementation of their first car sharing program down there. Um, and uh, to answer your question, so we have a concierge platform that is used in concert with all of our um, 
public transit pro programs. Um, and what that allows is someone who doesn't have a smartphone the opportunity to book a ride um, through a call center. And so RTC's call center is going to utilize that platform um, to allow anyone to access um, uh, uh, Lyft services um, to meet Title VI obligations um, and to, yeah, to allow just any passenger the opportunity to access Lyft. Um, with respect to wheelchair accessible vehicles, um, uh, while there are not as many on the Lyft platform, um, we always work with our um, transit agencies and local part and national partners um, to um, ensure that there is on-demand wheelchair accessible vehicles as part of the operations. Um, and so we're working with RTC and um, Safe Ride, uh, which is a national partner of Lyft, to ensure that as part of this program. Thank you. Dan, have you identified how many uh, participants in the pilot program? Um, Chairman, we are, we are currently looking to have 200 participants in this program, and we're well on our way to having that with the various phases that we talked about, including dialysis patients, the visually impaired, et cetera. Great. Thank you. So we need a motion for approval. Thank you. Motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to item number 44, which is to appoint members and an alternate to the RTC Finance Committee. Do we have any volunteers for one of the most exciting committees <laughs> of the year? You get to deal with Mark, you get all the wonderful numbers. Mayor Woodbury, Yay. Mayor Woodbury, Mayor March, two, and an alternate. I'll do alternate, but I'm a little busy. Commissioner G <laughs> will be the alternate, and I will be the third member. We have a team. We have the finance committee. I'll put that out in a form of a motion. On the floor, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. Opposed. <laughs> motion carries. And item number 45, we can delete. We do not have a reason to meet with legal counsel, which brings us to item number 46, which is to conduct your final citizens participation period. It's our second time set aside for public comment, those wishing to speak. And if you have a card, great. You're still welcome to come down. Alita Dupree. Alita, did you see those numbers earlier on the... Uh, App purchases was it three. MJ, what was that number on the slide? Three hundred thousand. Yes, we sold three hundred thousand passes to date. Over hundred thousand downloads. Wasn't too long ago yeah. you were up here asking for that, so w thank we're you, moving Chair. in the right direction. Go ahead, please. All right, thank you again, Chair Brown, um, members of the panel, Alita Dupree, for the record. I'm encouraged by the things that I'm hearing in these meetings, whether I'm here or whether I'm away, and I catch the video online afterward. And I know there are ways I could submit my comments online as well. Uh, but we're making some history today. So I show you here my RTC app, which uh, I'm about ready to buy another pass uh, shortly. So I usually buy 15s and 30s. I really like the 15s. Uh, they give me a lot of uh, flexibility, and the new self-enroll feature for reduced fare that I have has been extremely helpful to me, and I've shown it to others. So uh, this is work that I'm not seeing in other agencies that we are taking leadership with. Um, I am encouraged about the new buses, the 17,000 series that are coming in, which will make it easier for me to make my travels uh, as they have more sideways facing seats and I don't have to worry about climbing stairs. So I support us continuing to buy these new flyer buses and as this procurement expires, it's important that we continue at least to work on CNG, but we also should begin to test a battery powered bus. I think it can be done in this climate within our mileage. I am monitoring the developments of Antelope Valley Transportation Authority, which is running 
uh, these 60 foot long electric buses in uh, high temperature locations. So it's important that we look out there and see what's going on. We have to continue this work with the app. I'm seeing more people using this. The app helps me to manage my fare, especially as a person with disabilities and not having to go and buy paper passes and wondering if there are going to be paper passes when I get there. And so I am most excited about the work that we're going to be doing with Lyft. As a disabled veteran who uses uh, the Veterans Transportation Network on occasion, uh, this is another program that will help me to get around. I remember the days until March 14 when I had to walk from Rainbow and Warm Springs one mile to the Veterans Administration Clinic on Warm Springs in Buffalo. Now I have several buses that take me into that area. Thank you again for this work. Maybe I'll be back next month, but if not, I will certainly watch you all on the video and I'll keep buying passes while I'm here on my phone. Thank you. Thank you. Timothy Hatcher. I apologize in advance for the pronunciation. Okay. <clears throat> hey, yo. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. How are you doing? My name is Kenneth Teacher. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. I'm here to support the restoring of the service area to the way it was in 2011. Mm, I have some friends who live outside the service area and cannot get to work or their grocery store or doctor appointments independently. Um, people with disabilities deserve to be a part, to be as independent as possible and to be a part of the community. Um, I hope you, I hope that you commissioners listen to the, the testimonies today to and support restoring the service areas on the way it was in 2011. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Havender Davis. Good morning, um, commissioners. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Great. I just wanted to um, express my feelings on the service area. Um, are you guys considering the service area expansion? As my um, friend just spoke earlier, we, we do have a lot of people that is outside of the service area who have to walk a mile, maybe a half mile into the service area to catch paratransit. And it just would be uh, much better for them and their transportation needs if we could transfer that back to where it was in 2011. Um, in Nevada, we have always gone above and beyond the ADA guidelines, and it's just very shocking to me that in transportation we are not doing that, and I would hope that you would help to make transportation for persons with disabilities better so that they can go to church, go to friends' houses, and be more independent in transportation. Thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you. Robin Kincaid.
a long time ago in a galaxy far away, we were on a little league field together. That's correct. That's correct. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, Commissioner Brown. It's good to see you. Yes, we go back a ways. Our, our children are now grown, aren't they? Uh, my name is Robin Kincaid, and my daughter, Kayla Kincaid, has been using the paratransit services for the past 10 years. Kayla's a person with a developmental disability. The restrictive service area has been problematic for my family since it was changed back to 2011. You see, my daughter wants the very same things that your daughters and your sons and you yourself want in life. She wants to be able to visit her grandparents, visit with friends in their homes, and receive job coaching services, and most of all, attend her place of worship. Each one of these places has been in the same location for over 15 years, but none of them are located within the current paratransit service area. You know, it's time to recognize that the service area is not expanded to include many of these places that I have uh, identified in the Sun City Summerlin area. I urge you to place this discussion item on the next agenda, or next meeting's agenda, and to restore the service area to the pre-recession size service area back in 2011. Just like persons who do not have a disability, my daughter Kayla deserves the opportunity to attend her church and to visit her grandparents' homes. Unfortunately, the cur current service area restrictions do not allow those trips to be made for her. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. And we will, uh, I, next meeting, the March meeting is a full agenda, but we're going to place a discussion and presentation item on the April agenda where staff will bring forth current regulations, some challenges, some potential solutions. So uh, I, I think we're scheduled for April. Is that correct, MJ? Okay, thank you. And we'll make sure that everybody's notified. All right. Stephanie Vesnik. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Stephanie Versnick. This is the fourth time that I have spoken to the commissioners. Every time I speak, my message is the same. In my last testimony in January, I asked the commissioners to add a discussion item to the next month's agenda of restoring the service area. I have to say I was very disappointed when the agenda came out and it was not on the agenda. As I previously stated, when the RTC paratransit service area was reduced in 2011, there were two main reasons. One was the significant econ economic downturn in Nevada, and the second was due to severe state budget cuts to Medicaid transportation funding. RTC paratransit ridership of Medicaid patients increased. Again, I know reducing the service area must have been a very difficult decision for this commission to make at that time. However, now in 2018, seven years later, things are quite different. Our economy is on a high. Medicaid has restored funding to a company called MTM for Medicaid patient transportation. Again, the rationale for reducing the service area in 2011 no longer exists. This essential service was taken away from people with disabilities for two reasons which do not exist today. The cost, according to your own estimates, to restore the service area to the way it was in 2011 is $1.5 million. It seems to me that there's an awful lot of money being spent on promotion and development 
of the light rail line to carry tourists from McCarran Airport to the downtown area, and much attention is given to the free downtown loop shuttle service catering to our tourists. I know that the tourist population is very important to our economy. However, so are residents of Las Vegas, which include people with disabilities. Again, I'm asking this commission to add to next month's agenda, restoring the service area to the way it was in 2011 as a discussion and action item. As I previously said, I do not believe that $1.5 million is too much money to change the lives of many. And I do believe that people with disabilities are definitely worth the conversation. I'll leave you with this quote. A community that excludes even one of its members is no community at all. Thank you. Thank you. Trish Levitt. Good morning. My name is Trish Levitt, and I am here to speak on behalf of my son, Austin Levitt. Right here. Um, anyway, Austin is 23 years old and lives at our house, and we purchased the lot next to us to build him his own house and get him, we are also working on getting him gamefully employed outside of our own business that we own. Um, he has the following credentials. He has a sheriff's card. He has a current Nevada identification card. He has a food handler card, a current RTC paratransit card, and is a Gold United Blood Services donor. He currently volunteers weekly at Three Square, Las Vegas Rescue Mission, and the Salvation Army. He, also, he and I also participate with any garbage cleanups with Northeast Area Command, Metro, and our um, crew up on Sunrise Mountain in North Las Vegas and the Wetlands Park as well. Chris, you've been there with us. <laughs> Anyways, as I stated, Austin has a paratransit card, and I was under the and I was of the belief that it was created for door-to-door -door service. We are 0.07 miles away from Hollywood and Stewart, and I'll represent to you that cars speed up and down Stewart over 40 to 50 miles an hour. So um, in order to get him to be acclimated to the bus and to be able to get on by himself, on and off by himself, I am asking about door-to-door -door service for the RTC. And that is it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I just. Councilwoman. I have to leave now, and I just wanted to ascertain that you had said we cannot have it, uh, the, the, the item on the agenda next month because it's so crowded, but the following month, April, it will be on the agenda. I know the speaker before you said for the next agenda, but that's not possible. So I just wanted to make sure that they understood that. You understood that. Is that all right? Mr. Brown? Yes, it will be April and um, the timing going into the budget cycle. Uh, we, we don't want this simply be a presentation. We want this to include uh, what other communities are doing, the comprehensive data, the ADA, the legalities involved. So we anticipate this item alone in April will be a lengthy one to make sure that all the opinions are discussed appropriately. So even though it's another month, it's, it's to your advantage so that everybody can collect all the information they need to. I'm sorry I have to leave at this time, but I do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we, we could probably, we could probably, let, let's not commit yet until we have the information, but the, ideally if we're in a position we could have the discussion item and possible action, or at least direction to staff. It, I, I don't think it's something we can just turn on the switch. But let's, let's, we, we certainly have six weeks to get prepared for that. Rita Varney.
Good morning. Good morning. My name's Rita Varney. I'm the mother of an adult child with a disability. I have focused my life and career choices on the care and the rights of people with disabilities since my daughter was diagnosed. I've been involved with special education advocacy since my daughter was in grade school and a volunteer EMT in my New Jersey community. We transferred to Las Vegas about 10 years ago and loved Vegas so much that we built a home that would accommodate our daughter and ourselves, our retirement home. We built it with our daughter in mind to offer her safety and the ability to live as, an independent and as independent as possible and the knowledge that we were aging and our need for access to shopping, hospital, and medical services. We live in the Centennial Hills area, one and a half miles from Centennial Hills Hospital and the shopping and the doctors. Perfect location. I also live one half mile out of the service area, the provided service area. Outside the service area means my daughter does not have access to those services that are a mile and a half away from our home. As an individual who does not have employment opportunities at this time, now there are limitations on her socializing. She must rely on her family, me, and that's okay. Uh, but what happens when I'm not here any longer, or I'm unable to, to drive and get her where she needs to go? And how is that teaching her independence and self-esteem? Las Vegas housing market is booming and house values are increasing. We're getting sports teams, medical facilities, and weather makes it a great retirement area, that's why I'm here. Which led me to do some Googling. Were you aware that Las Vegas has three master plan communities that are current in the current market areas and two are not serviced by paratransit? One of those communities is the third largest selling in the country, Mountain's Edge. The other being Sky Canyon. That's 21,500 homes. Then I Googled 55 and over communities and found 18 communities that actively pop up. Out of those 18 communities, and I'm sure there's more, seven are not within the service area. Homes in those seven communities number 14,613. That's over 36,000 homes with at least that many residents. Those people are paying taxes. How many are in need of transportation? Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, prohibits discrimination and ensures equal opportunity and access with persons with disabilities. Having appropriate and accessible transportation is critical for parents of those persons or those persons themselves. It removes people from isolation and segregation and the ability to enjoy the life with family and friends without having to bear the shame or stigma of being born or having acquired a disability. Without it, it limits access to work, health care, independent living, and enjoyment of life. We have military veterans who come home after fighting for our country struggling with obstacles and barriers every day. And their main VA hospital is not within the service area. It's simple. Take away your car or access to transportation for a day. And then have a doctor's appointment or want to go out to lunch. Think about it. Disabilities are not always seen. We name them, visual impairment, deaf, anxiety disorder, cognitive brain disorder, those with physical limitations, the list goes on. Individuals work for years to get to a place where they are able enough to be assessed by the RTC to be deemed eligible for paratransit. And then you give them a barrier of an existing service area, our own wall. Expanding the area for a population of residents with current disabilities or disabilities acquired as the age is the right thing to do. There's a huge need. I, too, ask the commission to add restoring the service area to the pre-recession service area, and I'm happy that you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to the board? Seeing and hearing no one will close this portion of public comment. Thank you all. This meeting is adjourned.